I want to do a set of videos on authentication with FastAPI. And these are going to cover different scenarios for authenticating. So we'll look at things like basic authentication, stateful and stateless token authentication, including JSON web tokens, API key authentication, and also OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. And we're also going to do an integration with super tokens in a future video. So I want to dive into the core concepts of authentication with FastAPI and look at the pros and cons of each of these. So let's kick this off. Before we get started, if you want to support the channel, check out this coffee page that we have just below the video. We've also got a link to join the channel if you're finding this content useful. So let's go to the documentation here. For the simplest cases, we can use HTTP basic authentication. And this is super simple. It's just an HTTP header that contains a username and a password. And if the server doesn't receive that, it will return an HTTP 401 unauthorized error. Now we can look at Mozilla's documentation on HTTP authentication. This is a page that will show you how to restrict access to your server with the basic authentication. I'll leave a link to this just below the video. Now if we scroll down, we can see how basic authentication works. So this is the flow here. The server will respond to a request to the client with a 401 unauthorized response status. And it's going to provide information on how to authorize using this response header. It's the www authenticate response header. So that's going to contain at least one challenge. And then the client that wants to authenticate itself with the server can do so by including this request header. That's the authorization header. You might have seen that before with JSON web tokens and so on. If we look at the flow diagram here, the client sends a request. If it needs authentication, the server will respond with that www authenticate header and the 401 status. The value of this header here, though, is set to basic if it's going to be requiring basic authentication. And the user will then provide the authorization header and set that to basic alongside the username and password. So this is super simple and it can be useful when you want to protect a resource, but you don't want to store user details in a database or anything like that. You just want to perhaps provide a basic level of security around a particular resource. Now, if we go to the authentication schemes at the bottom here, there are a number of these. We've got basic authentication. We also have bearer authentication. These use tokens to access OAuth2 protected resources. And there's some more that you can read through if you want to as well. Now, when you're using basic authentication, you have to use this with HTTPS for security reasons. So why is that? The user ID and the password are going to be included in that header and they're going to be sent over the network as clear text. So basic authentication is not secure in a remote environment. If you're using it, you must include TLS. I want to very simply implement HTTP basic authentication with FastAPI. There's more detail here on using it with Apache Web Server. And also if we scroll down, restricting access using Nginx. So these servers have basic authentication support built in. Let's just get to the coding part of this and we're going to install FastAPI and get started with basic authentication. Now I'm going to load a page here from the FastAPI docs on installing FastAPI. We can use pip or we can use UV. So what I'm going to do is install FastAPI standard, but I want to manage this using UV. So let's go to VS Code and we're going to initialize a project here using the UV init command. And if you want to know more about UV, check out the previous videos we've done on UV. And then we can run UV add and we're going to pass FastAPI standard and that's going to install FastAPI alongside any dependencies. Once that's installed, notice on the left hand side we have the project and we have a main.py file. Let's set this file up just now. So at the top, let's import FastAPI and instantiate an app object. And with this app object, we can start creating routes in the application. Now I'm going to hard code some credentials here for now. So let's create a username and a password. So the username is going to be Tony Soprano and let's create a password here. And what would be a sufficient password for this guy? Maybe Mafia. Now this function here, I'm going to change the name of this to secret response. And instead of a text response, I want to return some JSON data. So let's return a dictionary here with a key of secret and some message here. This is highly secret. Now we can turn this into a fast API route using the app.get decorator as one example. And the actual path here, let's just make that slash. So the root path of the application. And we can get rid of this block at the bottom. We don't need the if name equals main block for this because we're going to run this as a fast API application using UV. So the command for that will be UV run. And then we can run the fast API run command and we pass the path to the file, which in this case, it's not app.py, it's main.py. And we can specify a port number, for example, port 8000. And if we pass the dash dash reload flag, this is going to reload whenever we make any changes. So this is essentially the command to start that fast API development server. And we're running that using UV with the UV run command. 
Let's do this just now and make sure that this is actually going to work to start with. And you can see the server has started on localhost 8000. And if we go to the browser, we can see the response coming back. Now what we want to do is basically protect this API route here. We don't want to just return the response unless we've verified that the credentials are correct in a basic authentication scheme. So let's go back to the fast API documentation and let's go down here and see how to set up simple HTTP basic auth. Now we need to import these two objects, HTTP basic and HTTP basic credentials. So let's bring that import in to start with and we can add that to the top of main.py from fastapi.security we're importing these two particular objects. We then need to create a security scheme that's called HTTP basic. So we can instantiate the HTTP basic object and we can do that just underneath fast API object. So we've created this security object and that's an instance of HTTP basic. So we'll see how to use that in a second. Let's go back to the documentation. We're gonna use this security object with a dependency in a path operation. So what we need to do here is import annotated from the typing module. Let's start with that and we can do that right at the top here. And we're gonna create a dependency that we inject essentially into this particular route. Now, how do we do that? Let's go back to the documentation and I'm gonna copy what we're passing here in this documentation. Let's just copy the parameters for that and we can have a look at these in VS Code. So let's paste these in here and it's a parameter called credentials. And we're using typing.annotated here and we're passing HTTP basic credentials and a dependency. Now we need to import the pens from FastAPI, so let's just do that at the top. And I think I've got one extra parenthesis at the end here, so we'll remove that. Now this is a special type annotation. So HTTP basic credentials, these are given as a result of using HTTP basic as a dependency. And FastAPI is gonna use this to validate and parse that authorization header inside the function and return that as a credentials object. And we'll see how to use the credentials in a second. We also have the dependency on security. So this is a fast API dependency. It takes a callable function. Fast API will handle calling that function for you when this route is actually executed. So it's gonna run this security function, which is an instance of HTTP basic. So if we look at the usage section here, what this does is create an instance object and we can use that object as the dependency, as we just saw. And the result is gonna be HTTP basic credentials object that contains the username and password. So basically by injecting these credentials, we can extract the username and password and perform the check on the server. Now, if we actually go to this route, let's print out the credentials and let's save this and the server will reload and we can go back to this page and let's see what happens. When we refresh this page, notice we get this prompt and it's asking for a username and a password. So if I type in username XYZ and let's say this guy's got a password or password, we can then click sign in and let's see what happens. We get back the page and that's because we're not actually verifying the credentials at the moment. And if we go back to the server here, notice on the command line, we have the username of XYZ and the password of password. So essentially when we type that in, the browser is gonna send that authorization header with the username and password. And this statement here and that dependency is going to extract the username and password from the request header. And the next step is to perform the validation inside the route function. And just to show the header itself, if we go back to this page here and go to the developer tools, Let's refresh the page and it's automatically going to add that header now. So if we go to the headers here, let's check the request headers and we should have an authorization header and you can see it's been base64 encoded, but we are adding basic authentication. Now the next step is to verify the credentials. Let's go back to the server here and we can remove the print statement. And for now, this is gonna be quite simple. So we're gonna get the credentials object. We're gonna check the username is equal to this hard-coded username we have up here. And for the password, we can check that it's equal to this. Not the most secure process, but we are gonna try and improve this later in the video. And we actually return the JSON response if this statement evaluates to true and we have the correct username and password. If we don't, we need to remove that final return statement. And what we can do here is raise an HTTP exception. This is something from FastAPI, so we do need to import this at the top. So from FastAPI, let's import HTTP exception. And this will show the errors to the client if we have invalid credentials. So let's instantiate that. And we're gonna pass some details into this. So let's start with a status code. And I want to go to the top here and I want to import the status module from FastAPI. And the reason we're doing this is to refer to a status code by using this status module. And rather than hard coding a particular number, we can actually refer to it in a more idiomatic way here. And the status we're looking for is 401 unauthorized. And we can also pass some details back, for example, incorrect username or password. And we can also add that www authenticate header. 
So let's just do that just now. I'm going to paste that in here and we can tell the client essentially that we're using basic authentication by using this header. Now before we test this out, we need to actually log out. So what I'm going to do just as a hack here is log out by pasting this code at the top of the function. And that's because on the browser, once you've actually sent the username and password, it's going to do that automatically from now on until you're logged out. So let's just add this code here and I'm going to cancel that and we can go back to the client here, or back to VS Code. So that's a hack to log out and we are now going to be prompted for the credentials again. So let's see how this is going to work. We're going to go back to the browser. Let's refresh the page. and I'm going to add the same credentials as before and we're going to sign in. And we can see that the actual response here has the prompt telling us to log back in. So we don't have valid credentials there. This is what we get back. And it basically tells the browser to display that prompt again. And if we go to the network tab and try this again, notice we get back this response here. It's the 401 unauthorized response. Now let's actually try signing in with the correct credentials. If we copy the username here of Tony Soprano and we copy that secure password of Mafia, when we sign in, this time we actually get back the page. We get our 200 response and we can access the content. Now this might be working fine, but I'm going to move on to using bcrypt to actually hash this password. So we definitely don't want to store passwords in plain text on our server and we definitely don't want them in application code where they might be committed to GitHub, for example, and then accessed by potentially malicious users. So we can use a hashing algorithm like Argon or Bcrypt. And in this video, I'm going to use Bcrypt. Now let's go to the documentation or in the Python package for Bcrypt. And we're going to demonstrate how to use the Bcrypt package. So we're going to need to install that. So we can install the Bcrypt package with UV very simply. Let's go back to the terminal here and we can run the UV add command and we're going to add Bcrypt to this environment. And what that is actually going to do, if we look at pyproject.toml, is add Bcrypt to our dependencies and we can now use this inside our package. So what I'm going to do in this video, just to keep it simple, is I'm going to hash this inside the file, but of course you would want to store the password somewhere else. So this might seem redundant, but I just want to demonstrate how to use the bcrypt package. Let's import bcrypt at the top, if I can spell that correctly. And what we're going to do underneath the password is create a variable called hash. And we're going to take the bcrypt module and call a function called hash password. So hash password here is what we're going to call. And we can pass the plain text password here into that. And we can add a second parameter here of bcrypt.gensalt. Now what this function is essentially going to do is generate a cryptographic salt which is a random value that's going to be added to the password before it's hashed. And the password that we use here and pass in has to be in bytes, not a string. So we're going to use the dot encode function and we can encode that to UTF-8. So now we're passing the bytes in here and we're adding that random value with the gen salt method. And once that final value is generated, we then run the bcrypt algorithm to generate the hash. Now I just want to print this to the terminal so we can see the hash and then we can rerun the application at the bottom. So I've restarted the server and notice this here, we are actually getting the hash appearing on the terminal for that value. Now of course this hash should be somewhere outside of the code base. So you can imagine storing that in a file on the file system and having that locked down so that it can only be accessed by, for example, a particular user associated with this application. But just to keep things simple, let's just keep the hash value inside the code. And what we can now do inside of our FastAPI route is we can perform this check using the bcrypt algorithm. So there's one part of this that we need to change and that's the password check. Obviously we can keep the username check as it is at the moment. So let's create some code just above here to actually check the password. Now I'm going to create a variable called passwords match and we're going to run a function from bcrypt and this time it's the check password function. So above here we saw how to actually hash a password. That generates the hash here but we have another function called check password and what that's going to do is actually compare two passwords. So we have a password that's passed in and then the hashed password that we're actually wanting to compare it to. So the password we're going to pass in is the one that's been sent by the user. So credentials.password, that's coming from the authorization header. And we can then encode that to UTF-8. And that will create the bytes that are then going to be hashed by bcrypt. And we can compare that to the hash that we generated above from this password. So on the server, this is the master password that we have here. And we've generated the hash from that. And this hash should be stored somewhere outside of source control. And what we're doing inside the route is we're calling bcrypt.checkpassword. And bcrypt is going to take the password entered by the user and sent via the authorization header. It's going to hash that using the bcrypt algorithm and then compare it to the hash that we have above for that master password. So check password is essentially going to return a boolean, true or false. And we can then add that to the if statement here. So let's remove this line and we can add that passwords match. So if the username is equal to the one that we have above, 
and the passwords match, we can then return the content. Now, actually, password hashing is a fairly computationally intense process. So you might want to perform this username check before we actually check the hash. So for example, if the user enters the wrong username, we just want to immediately return the 401 unauthorized response. We don't want to perform the hashing every time. So you might want to adjust the logic here somewhat. The only reason I put this above the if statement is just so we can more easily explicitly see what's actually being checked here, but you could move everything I've highlighted directly into the if statement. So let's test this out and go back to the browser. If we refresh the page, we're prompted for the details. And again, if we enter something incorrect, we're going to get the same prompt again, as you can see here, because the details being sent back are the 401 unauthorized response. And we have this header here to tell the client to revalidate or re-verify the username and password. So let's go back and try this again with the correct details of Tony Soprano and Mafia. So we have Tony Soprano as the username and I'm gonna type that password. Now this should let us in, hopefully. As we can see, we get the response. And the reason for that is because we're sending the correct password. And when we call bcrypt.check password, this password here of Mafia is gonna be hashed when we pass it in as the first parameter. And then that hash will be compared to the hash that we have here. And in this case, they're going to match and we get back the correct response. Now, I really want to highlight a few things. This hash should not be stored in source control. And of course, the password should not be stored anywhere. The best thing to do is to have a hash stored somewhere on the Linux file system and make sure the permissions are very restrictive to access that. And then allow your application to read in that hash. And then whenever a client is trying to verify, you call the check password function in the bcrypt module and you can compare what they have sent to the hash that you've read in. And of course, the other thing to note here is that you should not be using this protocol with HTTP. You must have TLS enabled to make sure that the communication is encrypted. So if we refresh this again and look at the headers that are being sent, the request headers here have this authorization header. This looks like it's encoded, but it's very simple to decode this. And in fact, if we copy that and go to this base64 decoder website, we can paste this in here, and when we decode that, we get the plain text password that's been sent. So if you're using basic auth, it's crucial that you actually have HTTPS. So that is an important consideration. Now, I just want to finish by noting this is a very simple protocol. This should not be used in production applications with lots of users. So when you have real user accounts, you want to have the users create their own passwords and store those hashes in the database, and then perform the comparison when the user authenticates but you don't want to have to perform this hashing function every single time the user sends a request. That's gonna be an expensive operation. So you can use something like session authentication to prevent that and only perform the comparison when they are actually trying to log in and then use session authentication from there on. But if you do have something like an internal application, basic authentication can be useful for providing a very easy layer of security. And in cases of course where response speed is not important, but for more complex apps, you definitely want to look at different authentication protocols. But that's a basic introduction to authentication with FastAPI. And just to reiterate one more time, only ever use this with a secure connection or else your credentials will be very easily stolen. And of course, do not store the hashes and passwords inside the source control files. Have these in a secure place and readable by the application. And you can then use them to secure basic resources in your infrastructure. So we'll move on to more complex examples in future videos, but that's been an introduction to basic auth. If you've enjoyed this content and you want to support the channel, check out the coffee page that we've got below the video. And if you have any further fast API requests, let me know as well. There's plenty more content on that coming up on the channel. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.